evening, Journey Church. Are you guys glad to be in God's house tonight? Come on, give it up for them tonight. My name's uh, Brian Lamro, one of the pastors here. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're online with us tonight, thank you for being a part of what God is doing here in Jacksonville. We're in week 10, believe it or not, of our doctrine series. It is flying by, but uh, we are uh, talking about the foundations of our faith. What do Christians, or what should Christians believe? And, uh, you know, one of the things that we are discovering is who do we say that our God is, and what, who does the Bible say that our God is and who we worship. And so tonight, the message in the title is called God Sins. We're going to be talking about the local church. We're going to talk about what our role is um, as a church family and how God brings us together for a purpose and what God wants us to do in our lives. So if you would do me a favor, turn your Bibles with me tonight to Acts chapter 1. As you're turning to Acts chapter 1, let me talk to you a little bit um, about what we're going to be discussing tonight. The church uh, is growing and advancing. And the reason I know that is because the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing, the Bible says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That means that that God is in control and God is growing his church. It may not look like it when we look at our times and in America today, but how many guys know that that, uh, Christianity is far beyond what we see in our culture today? It's far beyond uh, the United States of America. In fact, uh, if if you were to look at where the church is and where the growth is, if you go to Timbuktu, anybody ever heard of Timbuktu? Uh, anybody ever heard of that little, that little place? If you go to Timbuktu, um, you would see now uh, geographically that that is where uh, the church central is. And from there, it has grown out and it's actually expanding in the largest in that area. And then it goes out and it kind of spans out throughout the rest of the world. But, um, you know, Christianity is on the move. God is on the move and he is still saving and changing lives and hearts today. And so as we look at the church, I want us to look at it as the big C. I don't want you to think about Journey Church. I don't want you to think about the church down the road. What I want you to do is think about the church as a whole, believers and followers of Jesus Christ, those who have put their faith and trust in him. So we're going to talk about the church tonight, and I think it's very important. You know, that the church, uh, believe it or not, as, as we look at it sometimes, we can say it's pretty jacked up. Uh, when, we, when we look at it in light of maybe some of the things that you've walked through, maybe some of the areas that maybe churches you've been in and you've been hurt before, or you know people that have been hurt in churches before. But the truth of the matter is, is that the church is not a building, that the church of Jesus Christ is strong and it is vibrant. And what we need to know is our place in the local body and how God wants to use us in a mighty way. Jesus came he, was, uh, he died, he rose again, and, and when he did that, he said he was going to send the promise, the Holy Spirit, and that's what we're going to look at and how the church was born and how it was birthed today. Jesus died for the church. It may be jacked up here. Sometimes we looked at it and we go, man, I don't understand all that goes on, but how many guys know Jesus died for the church? Jesus died so that we could have life, and he died for the people that would be the big C church today, and so we want to look at that. John chapter 10 says this, And we're going to pray. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for who? For the sheep. Jesus had a passion for his people. Jesus had a passion for the church. And Jesus was willing to lay his life down for us, and because of that, we should have a passion for people, and we should have a passion for the church, and we should have a passion to see the gospel go forward. So let's pray tonight and get into God's word together. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for sending your son. We thank you that he, he died. We thank you on the third day he rose again, and we thank you that you have now sent the precious gift, the promise, the Holy Spirit that we could have life today. And so, Lord, we just are comforted in that, that knowing that, that you are here. Lord, the Bible says, and your word says, God, when two or more are gathered in your name, there you are among us, and so you're here tonight. And so, Lord, we expect great things here tonight. Lord, we've come with great expectation as we read your word that you would change hearts and that you would change lives. Lord, you do it every time that we gather together under your name, the one umbrella, the name of Jesus. 
And so, Lord, tonight we have high expectations that we will know you at a deeper level. We have high expectations that you would move among us tonight. So, Father, I pray right now that you would stir in every heart. Holy Spirit, that you would move down every aisle, that you would touch every mind, and that you would touch every heart, that you would stir in this place the gifts that you have given us. And, Lord, that we would know and that we would trust and that we would love the church because you died for it. So Lord, speak to us tonight. Change our hearts that we would be mindful of that which you died for. In Jesus' name, amen. The people of God are so important. You know, we, we live in a community of believers. We are a community of believers. And when we truly know the purpose of for which we are here, I believe that God um, changes our attitudes, the way that we live. He changes who we are. And we have to understand tonight, because Jesus was willing to die for the church, we must be willing to embrace the call in which God has called us to. And so I, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the Gospel of Luke and also uh, the book of Acts, the, both of these books were written by Luke, and, and it's really two books in one. You know, uh, Luke would be part one, and uh, book one, and, and Acts would be part two. They were both written together somewhere in the time frame of, of 60 A.D. and 62 A.D., and they were written in consecutive moments. And, and what it is is you see in Luke, you see where Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the ministry and the work in which he was called to. And then you see in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit was fulfilled, the promise was given that Jesus had told the disciples who he would come, and then the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples to see the work go forth and to see the church being born. And so that's where we're going to be tonight. So we're going to start in Acts chapter 1. So how did the church begin? Well, the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, came in and he began to do a work in the life of Jesus the Son. We know where, where Jesus was baptized. You saw the, the dove, the Spirit of God come down like the dove and, and come on into Jesus's life. And then from there, he went to the desert and then Jesus fulfilled three years, three and a half years of ministry there on the earth. So as we look at the Gospel of Luke, and we look at this physician's account of Jesus' life, and we look at the account as he walked with Paul, we would see that the Spirit of God is who came in and actually began to birth the church. But first, let's look at the life of Jesus. Jesus' mother, Mary, conceived Jesus by the power of God and the Holy Spirit. Jesus was named by God Christ, which means anointed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is baptized, and the Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove, anointing him publicly, visibly, for ministry. Jesus was then led by the Holy Spirit to 40 days in the wilderness. He ultimately is tempted by Satan, resisted Satan, and then was led by the Spirit, the Bible says, back into town. He began his, he began his public ministry by opening the scroll in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2, and he reads this. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is what? Is upon me. The Holy Spirit is on Jesus. And then Jesus rolls up the scroll and he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. For the point, from that point forward, Jesus then casts out demons, he preaches, he heals people, he does great miracles, all by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in his life. So the Spirit of God is very important. He's the third person of the Trinity. And this is where we see as we pick up in Acts chapter 1. So the first book of Luke is all about the Holy Spirit and the relationship that he has with Jesus. And we're going to look at that. And then Jesus then in Acts chapter 2 begins to speak about the life that we would have with the person, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1. If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 1, here was, here's what it says, verse 1. In the first book, O Thelophysis, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he has chosen. Verse 3, he represented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. 
And while he was staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John the Baptist baptized with water, for you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But here's the key. Now listen to this, verse 8. But you will what? Say it aloud with me. Receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. So in the scripture, we see that Jesus is there. He's there with his disciples. He's, he, he's there after the resurrection. He's telling them, just wait, wait. There's a promise that is coming. This promise that I have for you is going to do great and mighty things in your life. This promise, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and the church is going to be born. You are going to do great miracles in my name, but I want you to wait. I want you to be still. They were, they were still in this place. They didn't understand. They're trying to figure out if Jesus is now going to establish his throne here on the earth. And yet Jesus is saying, just hold tight. I know you're confused right now. I know there's a lot that's going on right now. But what I want you to do is just wait because I have something wonderful for you. This power, you're going to receive power that I'm going to give you. And this power is going to cause you to be witnesses throughout the entire world for my namesake. I'm going to give you this power and you are going to do the impossible in my name. Guys, the church is to do the impossible feats for God. Tonight, as we talk about the local body, I believe that God wants us to move in power and great and might. He wants us to do great miracles in his name. That is why he sent the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is there, and he's there, and he's speaking. Jesus is there speaking, saying, just wait. And he instructs him to wait on the promise. And so we see this promise fulfilled in Acts chapters 2, Jesus is now ascended into heaven, and the believers are there. They're gathered all together. There's 120 uh, in this upper room, and they're there, and they're just praying, and they're waiting on this promise to be fulfilled, and that's where we're going to pick up. If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost, Pentecost was a huge festival where all the believers came together, where all the Jewish people came together and they began to worship God and they had all of these different feasts going on. So in the day of Pentecost, when it had arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly they, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Can you imagine this picture? They're praying and they're, and they're all together and they're all in one accord and they're, and they're sitting in this upper room and they're, and they're waiting on this promise to be fulfilled and they're all together. 